Well, we left off, pardon me? Oh, I thought you said something. We left off last time uh, looking at uh, CSS for the first time. And I mentioned that CSS is part of the three main languages that create web pages. That there is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In this class, we will focus on HTML and CSS. Um, we do get into a little bit of JavaScript towards the end. It's important to keep in mind like the role of each of these languages because they all fill a different need in creating a web page. HTML being the content, of course. The text, the links, the images, animations maybe, um, video, audio. But the content is defined in HTML. Also, what I'll call the logical structure. In other words, how things are organized and grouped together. These are the links that form the, the nav section. They're contained in a nav tag. These are the, 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 the stuff that's in the header. This is in the footer, and so on. The CSS is responsible for a couple of things, and they relate to the physical appearance of the page. Uh, one of them is just the appearance of the page. What color is the text going to be? How big is the text going to be? What font is going to be used? Are there going to be margins? Is there going to be space between paragraphs? All these things relate to the appearance of the page. They're not the content, right? You can have the same exact same content, but you could display it different ways depending on your needs on the site. Also, the physical layout. Now, the physical layout takes the logical organization and decides how to show it in a way that gets across and makes it easier for the user to understand. So, for example, the navigation. Maybe it will be along the side of the page and it will be in a different color. That way, the user looking at the page can instantly see, oh, okay, there's the navigation. And if you're consistent in doing that, as you go from page to page to page, your users understand the way your page is structured and laid out, and it will be real easy for them to find it. Lastly, C uh, I'm sorry, JavaScript really relates to um, interactivity and behavior. So when the user puts their mouse on a certain part of the page, maybe the page changes. So user does something, the page responds. Uh, and then there's other sorts of behaviors, too. That, that occur. Uh, in other words, the page doesn't just sit there. The page does stuff. All right, That, for the most part, is what's done in JavaScript. So I picked colors as sort of the first thing to look at, because that is one of the easiest things, one of the most obvious things to show, provided, again, you're not colorblind. Even if you're colorblind, depending on the kind of colorblindness that you have, you might still be able to distinguish that. Um, so I picked. Uh, again, color. Now that no means is the only thing that we can do. And we'll go over maybe a couple more of them today. And we will continue as the course goes on to sort of talk about HTML and CSS in parallel. In other words, we'll do a little bit of C, uh, HTML, we'll do a little bit of CSS and go back and forth. All right. Uh, there'll be times when we spend more time talking about HTML. There'll be times when we spend more time talking about CSS. All right, uh, and I encourage you to experiment as well. There's a great tool on W3 School, some of you may have already seen it, that allows you to go and play around with stuff and see how it works. Let's take a second to look at that before we get into today's, before we continue today's example. So if we look at learning, 
CSS. It shows an example. All right, these are some things that you can do on a web page. This one relates to the font family. All right, this relates to the background color. This represents the color of the text, and that the alignment of the text to center it. So if we look at this, we can see how this content, the H1 and the paragraph, are styled. It's in the CSS section of the, of the page. It's in the style tag. The first style rule says body, background color, light blue. And if you notice, the background color of the body is light blue. Why is that? Well, because everything that's viewed on the page is within the body of the page. So the entire, if you say body, light page. Now notice that they say background dash color. In the examples I went over, I said just background. Oops. It doesn't really matter. Background dash color and background do mostly the same thing. We'll talk about the difference between the two, because there's a little bit of a difference between them, but we'll talk about that later on. And what's nice about this is we can go and we can change this and see the impact of this. So I could say back hello color purple. Again, my aim isn't to make attractive pages. My aim is to teach how to use these things. So this, this page might look a little rough, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. Ooh. Yeah. Notice that that text is hard to read because of the yellow background. Let's make the background red instead. And let's make the color uh, yellow. Hopefully we'll be able to read this one. OK, there we can. Again, not necessarily attractive, but at least we can read it. All right, now if we analyze this, the entire page is red because I said the body's background red. I said the color, and remember, color relates to the color of the text. The color is yellow. Now, the cascading part of the CSS says that the H1, I've overridden the color of yellow with white. So that takes precedence over the body's color because, well, that HTML tag is closer to that text. So if I define a rule for an H1, that's closer to the H1 than the body is. So in other words, the H1 is in the body, so the rule for the H1 takes precedence over the rule for the body. So the color of this is going to be white. Color of the text is going to be white, not red. Or I'm sorry, not uh, yellow. And then I've added additional one text alignment to center that heading. All right, so now that's, that's, that heading is centered on the page. And finally, the font family, I specify, or for the paragraph, I specify a font family, and I specify a font size. So remember, we can do any, anything about the appearance of the page we can change. We've talked a lot so far in this class about the default behavior. Like I said, that an H1 is bigger than the other headings. Well, we could actually make H2s bigger if we wanted to. That would be confusing, but we could do it. All right? So I can make H1s even bigger if I wanted to. I could say font size 2EM. Now, in this case, they've used pixels. Pixels relate to the dots on the screen. EM relates to emphasis. So 2EM simply means twice as big as normal. It looks like it's already 2AM, uh, 2AM, right? 4EM. OK, there I made it 4EM, and you see it's a lot bigger. I could make this 0.8EM 
and this will be smaller than normal. The point is, is that don't think that CSS is only about color. Almost anything you can think about the web page that relates to how the web page looks can be controlled via CSS. If we go back to the CSS tutorial, we can pick stuff out. Um, we can pick out lists, for example. We can style lists. If you remember lists in uh, list in um, HTML get um, typically a bullet point, but we can change that. For example, this is what the default list looks like. This is what this list looks like. List style type none. I could say list style type circle. Let me just make this UL to do both lists. So instead of a bullet point, we have a circle. Or I could say list style type none. And we don't get anything there. So you're welcome on your own to try anything that you want. I'm not going to penalize you for doing stuff that we haven't talked about in class yet. All right? So the lab, you know, we call it a lab upstairs, right? And what do people do in labs? <laughs> they experiment, right? So I encourage you to try stuff out on your assignments. See what happens, all right? So one of the best ways to learn something is to take something that already works and say, what if I do this? What if I do that? And see the difference that it makes. So play around with these. Experiment. Try all these things. All right? Now, getting back to our example, I'm going to talk about a couple of things more on that example before we leave it for now. talk about our next topic. So here's our Monday. Whoops. Here's our Monday example. real quick rename it to Wednesday. The way the zipping works up is it like adds a folder each time and if I don't like drag it back to the desktop and make it its own folder pretty soon we'll have it 35 folders deep. Okay here's the example I had last time where I have the finished page. I'm going to open it up and it looks this way. All right. Why does it look this way? Well, again, we played around with a bunch of things, and I left off with this. H1 back, pound sign, 01DFA5. Okay? Now, we already saw the color of the H1s, the background color. I said background, background is the equivalent of background color. And we saw it was kind of a greenish, all right? I wish that I opened up the source code before I wished up the page. Uh, I opened up the page. Because we can tell that it's greenish, 
right? How can we tell that it's that it, this color will be greenish? Yeah. For red, we have zero one. That's not much red. For green, we have what? We have DF, which looks like which is kind of a screwy number. But remember, with hexadecimal, A through E, I'm sorry, A through F are also digits. So D actually is higher than the numbers 0 through 9, because you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D. So D is kind of a high number. So DF is a pretty high number compared to A5, right? Because A, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D. So D is higher than A. So there's more green in this than there is blue or red. There's more blue than there is red. So if I was going to describe this color, it's sort of a bluish green, but it's closer to green than blue. All right? Now that's the only rule that we have in here. All right? And as I was saying before, it actually goes a long way into making this page a little easier to work with. All right? Because the header being the different background color separates the page immediately into sections that the user can look at and see, OK, that's the first section, second section, third section, and so on. So even something small like this makes the page a little more usable. Remember, our goal is not just to make a page look pretty, look nice. Our goal is to use color in a way that helps bring out the content of the page and helps the user understand how the page is laid out and structured. All right? So we don't have to do tons of stuff. We just have to do the stuff that is going to make it uh, easier to uh, deal with the page. This isn't the best example, and I don't know if you can see it or not. But notice on the chart, the, the fire and tornado instructions. Notice is in red at the top of the page, and it's bigger as well. That will indicate you know, when you see something red, that's sort of, in, at least in our culture, a sign that there's some urgency to it. All right? And you know what? Even if you're colorblind, you don't notice the red, but you notice it's bigger. All right? The route that you're to take to get out is red, and then there's an alternate one that is green. And oh, the, the green means you are here. The purple is where to go if there's a tornado. So they didn't use a lot of colors on this, but they used colors judiciously. And they used them not to make this nice. You know, it's not like, wow, it's so beautiful. I want to hang that at my wall at home, you know. But it makes it more functional, makes it easier to see. Because you know what? If there was a tornado, you wouldn't want to sit here reading a gigantic chart and all that. You'd want to go straight to the relevant, important content. And I'm pretty much at a glance. Whoa, looks like there's a tornado warning. OK, the letter says the purple is the, now here's a little question. Is there anything we could do for colorblind people with this? Pardon me? Shapes. We could use colors and shapes. All right? We're going to have a whole unit on accessibility. All right? And accessibility is making your website such that people with different abilities and disabilities can access your site and get the same meaning. Well, we could, for example, still keep the red and purple, right? Because color is a powerful cue to people that can see it. But for people that can't see it, we could make the one line a dash line and the other line a dotted line. All right? So we're going to take and show the same thing two different ways. 
All right? And that's an important concept to remember, and we'll go over it later on when we talk about accessibility. Multiple presentation of the same thing. Numbers is big, and it's also in red. So, okay, someone that can see color, it might stand out a little bit more. But the fact that it's bigger makes that stand out even for people that can't distinguish colors. All right. Now, the question becomes, how many or what specific colors should I make my page? Now we said the colors of the page should sort of reflect the tone of the page, right? Barbie had a lot of pink in it. Barbie's web page had a lot of pink in it. Um, Ozzy Osbourne's um, was black, right? And again, that sort of fits the mood of the content of the page. If you went to a bank's website and it was all with spring pastel colors like pink and, you know, that would kind of, I don't know, it might do something to the credibility. If you went to Ozzy Osbourne's site and it had those colors, it would be like, what? You know, it would be a little disconcerting. Now, how do you know what colors go to? So, so that's the first thing. You're going to pick colors that sort of fit that. Now, if the particular organization you're doing the website for has like a logo or something, you might want to match those colors. Like for example, sort of the colors of Lorain County Community College blue. So that predominantly on this site we have a lot of blue. All right. And again, Coca-Cola, if you look at the Coca-Cola logo, it's red and white. So if we went to Coca-Cola, primarily red, all right, which makes sense. So if you're working for an organization and they have like a color associated with them, you would, you would use that, all right? If you're not dealing with an organization, let's say you're dealing with a, you're creating a web page to help people understand uh, computers better, all right? Then you kind of have flexibility to pick the colors that you want that you think will, will, will uh, get your message across. How many colors should you use on a web page? Two? Maybe three? Right. Yeah. Yeah, the real, the real answer is it depends on the page. Of course, that's probably the answer to any question of, like, what should we do on, on this page or that. Yeah, it depends on the page. But you're absolutely right. Unless you have a really good reason for it, two or three or maybe four colors, would be enough. And when I say colors, I'm not talking about white or black. You can kind of have white and black on colors, uh, you know, almost don't count, because you can put those on any page and it will work, all right? If you think about it, if, we're, if we go back to what I said before about using colors to help emphasize certain things and to help organize a page, if we use a couple colors, that can be effective doing that. Like one color here is effective doing that. If, however, I had a mix of 10 different colors on this page, then it would just be chaos and it would be overkill. I wouldn't be able to tell what, was, what the colors meant. Why were they grouped together? Like if this was green and this one was red and this one was yellow, and the navigation section was blue, and this was purple. It would all just sort of blend together, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish the different sections of the page as, easy, as easily as when you just do something really simple like this. Now, some people have a real good eye for picking colors. You know, you, you, know, you, you, could, you could tell, you know, some people just, you just look at the clothes they're wearing, right? And it's like, wow, that's a real put-together outfit, all right? You know. 
the, 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 the top and the, and the pants, they match so well, and, you know, and the shoes and the belt, you know, it just all goes together wonderfully. I'm not one of those people, all right? Fortunately, there's sort of a science to it. So it's not all just personal taste. There's a science that helps you decide what colors go together, all right? And what we can do on our website is we can take advantage of a number of tools uh, that help us pick colors that go together well. So let's go and let's look at HTML color wheel, usually, or color scheme, or something like that. And This isn't the one I'm looking for. Let's see. Website color scheme generator. Okay. There's any number of ones that you can pick. This is one that I normally use. The Peloton one. The interesting thing about this is this can be a little hard to read on the, on the screen, <laughs> all right? A site that helps you pick colors, the colors are kind of a little iffy on here, a little hard to read. Let me tell you that on the computer screen, it's a lot easier to read, all right? Now, here's the basics of this, all right? You can pick the general kind of color that you want, and then it will give you colors that, in that family, that go together, all right? That's what's called a monochromatic scheme, where I'm going to pick, let's say, orange, because this is fall, and it's going to show me different shades of orange that I could use to make the page look good and complement each other. So maybe I like this color for the background of the whole page. All right. Thought you could click on it and get to where you copy and paste it. All All right, I'm not seeing how to do that, so uh, let's see. Maybe what does this do? Yeah, there I go. I can copy this. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to make it the back for my whole page. So I'm going to say body. background that. Let's get thank you. So I'll go do that and it'll take my web page and make it look like this. Or maybe it won't. It will if I remember to save it. Okay, so that's the look of the whole page. All right, I can then go pick other colors for other stuff. Like maybe I'll make the text this color. And again, notice what I'm doing here that if, even if I don't know, all right, 
even if I don't know what that color code means, remember we talked about the RGB and the hex codes and all that, just copy and paste it, right? So it's probably it's good to understand that, but if you're still a little fuzzy about how that works, you can still use it, right? You don't have to know about satellites to use your GPS, right? You just know what to type in. Same thing here, copy and paste. Believe it or not, it did change it. It's just close enough to black that I can't tell the difference. All right? Now, I could, first I thought it didn't change it. Uh, I could then put some accents in. Maybe I'll make the H1s this color. Well, now that's a little hard to read. Maybe I will make I'll make the text white. Again, white, black, and shades of gray really don't count in the in the number of colors that you're using. All right, that's not half bad, all right? Notice too, it did take a lot of work to elevate this from a page that just looked like the page that we did the Okay, we didn't do a lot of colors here and all that, and we spent just really a little bit of effort, but just notice how much better that that looks, all right? How much better that looks than the original. You know, you can tell that some thought, some design was put into it, and we're doing things to make it look better, but we're also doing things to make it more functional, easier for the user to distinguish the pieces of the page, and so on. All right. Now, there's other kinds of color schemes, too. This is the monochromatic. Monochromatic, you know, one color. That's sort of the basic. You pick a shade, you pick a general color that you want, it gives you different variations of that. There's also what are called triads. And a triad is where you have three colors. So I pick maybe as my base yellow, and it gives me colors that are close to it, but not the same. So for example, I pick yellow, it will give me yellowish things, but it will also give me greenish things and slightly orangish things. These are wider space triads, in other words, they're far apart on the color scheme. These are tetrads, which are far apart still. So you can use these to come up with the sort of scheme that you want. For something that, like, if you were doing a site, 
a fashion site, for example, you might get more adventurous with the colors and not just use a straight monochromatic. If you're doing something for a law firm, maybe you'd stick with monochromatic, something very straightforward. Again, it needs to match the tone of the site and be effective in helping the user understand the content of the site better. Okay, so we have one page here that we put our CSS code in. Again, we could do all kinds of other stuff with this. We could change the font size and all that, experiment, have a blast, and so on. But my second page is back to looking like this. Okay? How can we make sure that the two pages look the same? Well, uh, exactly. The, the correct answer is we're going to create a separate CSS file. Now you might think, well, I'll just copy and paste the code into the other page. And honestly, that's not that hard to do, right? The problem comes in is when you go and change something. If I decide I want to add to the CSS, I'd have to remember and go and add the CSS and change the CSS on all of the pages on my site. And it's going to have just two pages, more than likely. A, web page, a website's going to have a bunch of pages. One of the key things that we try to do in any sort of software development is to make our life easier to go and make changes to the site or to the software or whatever. And one of the key principles for that is that stuff should be in one place. So in this case, it would be nice if all the CSS is in one place. Then each page could point to that place, and if we changed it in one place, it would change it for all the pages. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a separate CSS file. So I'm going to cut this code out of here. I'm going to create a new, pay, a new file. I'm going to paste it in, and I'm going to remove the style tag. You don't need the style tag anymore because the browser is going to know that this is CSS a different way. So we don't need the style tag anymore. I'm going to save it. as site.css. Okay, just going to give it some name. Okay. Now what I have to do is I open up both these pages and point those pages to the CSS file. Tell these pages, hey, this is the C this is where you find the CSS for this page. So you do that like this. And this will also appear in the head section. So I'm going to go link, not jink, link. Type equals text slash CSS. Rel equals style sheet. href equals, what do you suppose href equals is going to show me? The name of the file. Right. Remember, we've seen href before. All right when we've done links. It's the name of the file that we want to link to. Well, and href stands for hypertext reference. So we put to the name of the CSS file we want to use. Now it's in the same folder as my HTML code, so all we have to do is say site.css, because that's the name that we gave it when we saved it. Uh, 
This indicates that this is the start and end tag rolled into one. Because there's no end tag for this. There's nothing in between. The, there's nothing in between there. So this simply says, hey, this tag is the start and end tag rolled into one. You could. And in fact, you can even omit the end tag if you wanted to. But old habits die hard, right? And this is typically how I do it, so that's why I'm showing it to you. Okay, so now we have the page, and looks like it did before. I can put this back in the other page as well. It's helping the browser identify that this code is going to contain CSS. Actually, the rel, I don't think you need anymore, strictly speaking. The rel was back in the old days. I think all you need is type text equals CSS. And I lied. Or I forgot to save. One of the two. All right, so it's used. Maybe I can get rid of, the, maybe I was mistaken. This is the one you can get rid of. Yeah, you can get rid of that one. But in the old days, you had to supply both. So I kind of do that out of force of habit. Now, what that does, and the reason that there's both of them is, I'm sure back in the old days, different browsers, like Internet Explorer versus Firefox, blah, 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 recognize one and not the other. So you put both of them in, that way you were covered in Internet Explorer, you were covered in Firefox, and so on. Now all my CS code is in one place. And if I had 100 pages, I would put the same link on one all, all 100 pages. And if I want to change something, let's do this. Let's change the font size of H1s to 4EM. So we're going to make it four times as big as normal font on this page. I to save the CSS file and both pages get the change. So you, can you imagine at one change of a file, I could have a website that had that was that used blue, purple, gray. I could make all the changes to that one CSS file to be red yellow, orange, and every page on the site would have its color changed from the one scheme to another. Yes? So uh, when, when it's cascading, it's a CSS file on the highest layer, so that means when it's this page, the one in uh, the H1 is not 4 and it's 4 EM. Right. So you make it 1 EM and then it makes that big. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is a little ahead. That's a really good question. If, for example, I wanted these H1s to be small. Say I want tiny H1s on this page. If I had style defined right on here, it takes precedence.
or does it? It will do it if we put this underneath it. This is one case where the position does matter. Notice up here, the second one applied. The one in the file applied because the file is after this. In this case, though, if I want that one to apply, I put it after that, and then it will apply. So it's kind of like the last one in wins. It's kind of like the last one overrules any previous ones. It's a little quirk in, in this. I'm actually a little bit surprised about that. I haven't done this in a while. And I guess when I have done it, I've put it after it so I wouldn't have noticed. And that's actually a key point. Because number one, there may be pages, individual pages, that you want to look different, all right, for whatever reason. Secondly, we'll learn several weeks from now about how if you want to have a different style sheet for mobile devices than desktop and laptop computers, you can actually create two style sheets and tell the one only to apply in certain circumstances. And it's going to work based on that principle, that you set a basic CSS file for everyone, and then boom, you have, a, you have a, a, a second CSS file, either for a mobile device or for a desktop device. So the fact that this sort of notion of, like, the last one wins is something that's important. Other questions? There's another way to do style, which is called uh, inline style, where you put the style right on the tag. But I'm going to avoid doing that, because it's usually not a good idea. All right. Um, I think that's all to our introduction to CSS. Next week, we will talk about images, all right? And we'll cover how to put images on the page and how to incorporate images into the style of a website and all, a whole bunch of other fun facts about images. All right. I'm going to post this to Canvas, the example to Canvas. I'll be upstairs in a minute to unlock. If you have anything that needs graded, Upload it to Canvas and get my attention, and I'll grade it All right, during the lab session. You don't need to pull it up on your machine. I'll download them and take a look at them on my machine. All right, we'll see you up there.